This is the Cats and Pudding Podcast. A melting pot of pudding. And now, here's Jen. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Cats and Pudding. And today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Paul Borghese. And I said it right, right? Yes, you did. I, that was it. Was it a good finesse the way I said it? Perfect. As I, your your, your last name sounds like a, like a song, Borghese. It sounds like Borghese? a sauce. It sounds like like a, like you would ha- like order like a side sauce of Borghese or like a fine wine. Yeah, like What's pasta that? Borghese instead of Bolognese. Right, exactly. That's what it sounds like. So it's 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 like a musical last name. It's a well, actually, my real last name is Borghese. Without the H, I'm from Sic- my family's from Sicily. Okay, me too. Uh, but I threw the H in there as a as a as a stage name, and it just stuck. Would so Borghese would be from Rome with the H, but without the H, uh, it's, it's a Sicilian. It's Sicilian, so I'm S- uh, Sicilian and Borghese. Yeah. So we now know we 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 call me Borghese. Everybody does. Okay. <laughs> Paul, call me Paul, Paul. of course. Um. So. Paul is a, an actor for many years, and I, you're an Italian American actor, so which is you know great for our community, which we love that we have we have all these wonderful actors in our Italian American community. How did you get your start? Oh gosh, I'm always I'm always asked that question. Yeah, how did you get your start? I you know, uh, well I mean you know when I was much younger, when I was in high school, I I, I did a couple of plays. Um, I always kind of had a desire, but I kind of did the plays because my girlfriend in high school was the makeup artist and mm-hmm. talked me into doing the plays. So I don't know if it was out of a, a passion for wanting to do it, but it wasn't until I got out of college and I opened up, um, uh, I was in the restaurant business twice and I opened my first one, which was a pasta and pizza joint. Where were you from? Uh, well, I was born in the Bronx. Okay. Uh, my roots are in Little Italy, the Bronx, Arthur Avenue. Our family business was B&G Clothes. It was there for almost 100 years on wow. East 187th Street. It's not there anymore, though, because, uh, you know, my dad's not here, his brothers, and my cousin ran it, and then he sold the building and moved to California. But um, I, so I, I had this pasta and pizza uh, joint with a beer and wine bar, you know, and my friend, it was called Al Paulie's because my best friend's name was Al, and I was Paulie, so we called it Al Paulie's Oh, I love that. Pizza, pasta, and pizza what and pasta. What a great name. So uh, we did a commercial, like a local cable commercial, and it was so much fun, like between writing the commercial and being part of the production and doing the voiceover and being in it that I got the bug. So right. I, after having gone to college and having a, a bachelor's degree, I went back to school to Center for the Media Arts in Manhattan to learn film and television production. At the same time, I went to HB Studios to study acting. So I was wow. doing both at the same time in my late, I guess, 20, I think it was about 27 or something. Were you married? Did you have children at this point? Uh, no, or? no, I didn't get married till uh, till I was thirty five years old, and I'm single. And I'm single now. Now you're single now. Yeah. Okay, girl. No, I was very single, single then, now. and I'm very single now. <laughs> <laughs> In case anybody wants to know, <laughs> girls, there we go. Um, so you, so you got the acting bug, and then you went to school. So what was like your, what was your first acting gig? Like your first real acting gig? I don't know. You know, uh, it, it, I started out. Early on, you know, like everybody else, doing a little bit of background work, a little bit of extra work, and and then, um, you know, small like small parts in bigger movies, mm-hmm. and then bigger parts in smaller movies. So I, I think a lot of stuff I did early on was with Trauma. I don't mm-hmm. know if you know Trauma films. They did like I was in Toxic Avenger oh, yeah, two and Toxic Avenger three. I was in Class of Newcomb High two. Mm-hmm. I was in Trauma's War. They they were like a, a cult, cult kind classics. of film production. They were like cult, yeah. So I did a bunch of stuff with them. I actually was working in stunts at the time. But you were a stuntman? Uh, which I don't anymore. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I worked a whole summer on a movie for them uh, as a character, but also being on the, the stunt team. What kind of stunts did you do? Oh, you know, everything from I mean, like high you jumped falls. out a window, like you jumped out of buildings yeah, and well, like I, you know, planes not, and stuff like that. You know, that. a couple of stories, but like high falls I learned. We did fire gags. We did, you know, of course, you know, combat, hand-to-hand combat. Well, that's fun. That but was I don't it know about the, the height part. thing. I yeah. couldn't handle the height thing. I'm afraid of heights. I don't One think time I had to dress like a woman <laughs> because uh, there was a woman in the uh, movie and she had to like kind of go flying over this thing and they put me in her, well, her wardrobe and wig <laughs> and everything. As long as you didn't see my face, it was like... <laughs> It was really, t- I, lo- I made a very ugly woman, so I have myself pictures of it. A lot it. of people make very ugly women. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't make it in this world as uh, 
what's going As on. Always. I won't. I won't start. Okay. Although yesterday was. Uh, it was Pride. Pride Day. Yes, it was. Yes. It was very. It, the city was thriving yesterday. With I had to come pride. into the city last night because I had dinner with uh, Dominic Keenacy. Who played uh, up with Junior and the Sopranos? He? Oh, he's That's great. Junior from the Sopranos. He, yeah, he he's going back to London tomorrow. And Al Sapienza, mm -hmm. who played Mikey well, Palmici, yes. who was sort of his like right hand man on the show. So we had dinner last night at an Italian restaurant in the city, and I forgot that it was Pride Day. So I was like, Oh my God, what's going on in the city? And then I was like, Oh, I know what's going on. It was a little a little crazy. And I lived in Greenwich Village mm -hmm. for over twenty years in Manhattan. So. Um, I, I saw it all, but I used to kind of get out of the city at that point. Yeah, it was just it was just like too much. It's a it's a it's a lot. Going I'm not on judging. The I'm just saying the it's the activity. Active. It's know. just active. Yeah. there's yeah. a lot of stuff going on. I had, I just had a pride party last week. I do I do uh, one every year, so it was a lot of fun. Right, we had a good time. We had a great time. I had so. a pride party too. You did Italian American pride. I I always in have October. Time. How was that? Italian American point? Cultural Month. Yeah, that, you I'm know, just kidding. I'm changing. I'm just trying to, you know, lighten up the whole pride. Let's go. Let's talk about let's something talk about else <laughs> besides pride. Yeah, so, like the American flag. Yes, let's talk about like the, the rainbow in the sky. Yes, the rainbow in the sky, the American flag. So what else? You were saying where did I? Those are some of my first gigs. Well, I know one of your yeah. most famous roles you were in. You played Yogi Berra in '61. Right? Yeah, so. well, that was probably the highlight of my career, uh, getting to play Yogi Berra in the HBO movie 61. Uh, Billy Crystal directed that. It had a, you know, How was it working with him? All-star cast. He was great. He was just, he's like a baseball encyclopedia. Yeah, so he, he knows is. everything about baseball. And he was so much fun to work with and so easygoing. And you must have laughed all day long. With oh, him. he was so funny. So much and fun. And he was so generous because there was so many extras in the, you know, in the stands, in the mm -hmm. stadiums. And, and. You know, they're not getting paid a lot. There's a lot of non-union extras, and they give maybe they're giving him a hot dog and a soda right. or whatever. And he would, like, get the megaphone every now and then and just do, like, stand-up. To entertain them. To entertain them. That's so nice. And to them, it was like, That was like, it was treat. better than anything. You know, what would they have to him. pay to go see Billy Crystal? Right, so they would have to pay up, yeah. hundreds of dollars to see him do yeah. stand-up live, and there they are getting their own private So he show. would do that every now and then, which I thought was, like, really, really admirable. And the movie won, we won uh, Best, at, well, it was nominated for... Uh, uh, Best Picture for an Emmy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it didn't win, but it had 12 Emmy nominations, and we won Best Ensemble Cast. Right. So technically, I'm a an Emmy Award winner because I was part of the ensemble, ensemble. cast. But it was it was a great experience. It was a great it was a great movie. Actually, and getting to know Yogi, you know, I mean, like HBO set it up for me to meet Yogi Berra. How was that? And, uh, oh, it was him. great. I met him before too. Yeah. I, I met him, Whitey Ford, and. Um, uh, I can't remember the, uh, the other guy's name I met on. I was at the Yankee Stadium. It was like the Yankee Day or whatever it was that I met them. He was such old a... Old-timers day or something. Yeah, old yeah. I was at all, it was all-timers. My, my friend's uncle is Whitey Ford, so we got to go. Oh, okay. So it was really cool. And then to meet Yogi Berra. He was such a cool guy. Yeah, I met Whitey at the, at the premiere. Uh, so, But that was a lot of fun because I had to learn how to switch hit. Yeah. That's when I played baseball as a righty. And Yogi... Uh, um, Played as a righty, mm -hmm. but hit as a lefty. Right. So that was very hard to do. And and Yogi helped me to do it. But if you watch the movie, we did so much training mm -hmm. in baseball besides, you know, studying as, as actors. Right. That you watch the movie and not one Yankee gets up to bat except Mantle and Maris. Because the movie was about right, the was Mantle about and Maris home run mm -hmm. race. So all that learning how to try to, uh, you know, switch hit. Right. Never made it to the oh, to the screen. Were you sorry? Did you did you join a, uh, did you join a softball team after that? So well, you I mean, I, 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 well, it was. I didn't become a great switch hitter. <laughs> don't get me wrong. I thought I was able to, you know, pull it off. But yet, it was one point in time in the premiere where you know the scene comes up and you mm -hmm. hear and batting next number eight. Yogi yeah. Berra, and I'm like, oh, this is where I'm going to. Like, you know. I'm going to get and to do it. It jumped like to another inning, and oh. I'm like, oh, I didn't, you know, but, you didn't get to do it. Yeah, but it's uh, it's all good. It's all but good. they did train you. Did you get? Did you? Did you meet any of the Yankees of that time? Oh yeah. Like, did you meet like oh, yeah. Derek or like? Well, they sent us to baseball training camp. Wow. I mean, some Tampa? people you pay. We, no, we actually went to um, Encino, California. I think it was, and um, the, some people pay to go to fantasy baseball yes. camp. I got oh, my paid. God. To go, to go to baseball you training went to baseball camp, camp with like Derek Jeter and like Jorge yeah. Posada. Well, it was like, you know, like Bobby, uh, Barry Pepper who played mm -hmm. Roger Maris was right. there and uh, Thomas Jane who played Mickey Mantle, Dominic Lambert Dozy, mm -hmm. who's doing fantastic now. He's another friend. He was playing Moose Scour and so Chris Bauer was there. So, um, you know, a lot of like the act, the main Yankee 
actors were there. So so we, we had a lot of fun. That must have been fun. Yeah. Do, uh, doing are that. you a Yankee fan or a Met fan? Of course I'm a Yankee fan. You have fan. to be a Yankee fan. Of course fan. I'm a Yankee How can I, I not be? Yeah, I mean, because you're from the Bronx. So so people don't, I don't know, how, not everybody knows this, but you were a Met fan because you used to be Brooklyn, was it Brooklyn Dodgers, and then they went to yeah. California. So those are who became Met fans, and anybody who was like in the Bronx, I guess, I mean, it's probably say North Queens too were, and, and Manhattan were Yankee fans. The Bronx Bombers. Right? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, really, having played a Yankee, how could I not be I, know, I love a the Yankee Yankees. fan? I was I was yeah. actually sad. I was there the le- when le- the last day that they had the old stadium. Derek Jeter was was um was was actually that was the day he beat. I think it was Mickey Mantle's record, and it was postseason, and, and that was the last time I was in that stadium. And then they they they, they knocked it down. They were building the new stadium. It was so cool. And I was sitting behind those iconic. You know, I was sitting in home, behind home plate. I was sitting by the, the, those iconic fold out white chairs. I was like, I was like, can I just take one of them with me? I was like, I probably would have got arrested if I would have took it. But it was cool. It was cool to you know, be speaking there. Speaking of Derek Jeter, like you were saying, that I meet some of the mm-hmm. Yankees. Well, I met the old some of the old timers that were still alive, mm-hmm. and I got to know Yogi very well. But at the premiere, it was funny because normally a lot of these Yankees, the current Yankees at the time when we had the premiere, Mm -hmm. you know, for me to, you know, for you to say hello to one of them or get an autograph, you know, they're all very standoffish or they're, you know, limited. Mm -hmm. So because I was at the premiere and, you know, like somebody like, like Derek Jeter came up to me after the movie to say, hey, you know, yeah, that you're a really good yogi. Like, I really enjoyed the movie. It was a great movie. And I'm like, he's coming up to me. Is that like a legend? under different circumstances, circumstances, if I went and said hello, he probably wouldn't even get eye contact with me. Not that he's not a nice guy, but who well, would he's got I be? So many fans. Who would I be if he didn't, you know, know me from anything? Wasn't that amazing? Yeah, it was great, great, great experience. Yeah. No, it was it was a good movie. And what? So besides sixty one, what was your? What would you say your? Well, I I know you said that you love playing yogi. Was that your absolute favorite role, or did you have something else that was maybe more meaningful to you that you liked that was, to play? Definitely my favorite role. I mean, I I I played a, a there was an independent film called Vito Bonifaci, which is a a faith based film mm-hmm. that I played the lead in. I played Vito Bonifaci, and that meant a lot to me because it was like a different type of role. You know, uh, I was an Italian American contractor who had fallen, so to speak, and you know, refines his faith, and um, so uh, I had to like dig deep. For that role, and and uh, I really enjoyed it, and, and and the film did well, in you know, in that marketplace, uh, got, you know, got nice reviews in the New York Times, and all that. So I felt like even though that was an independent film and a faith-based film, um, it was Im- important to me. I mean, I haven't played a lot of leads, mm-hmm. but I played a lot of you know character actors and and supporting roles. Um, of course, there's shows and that I've been on that I'm like, wow, you know, I'm. I'm so happy that I've been on Law and Order so many times. I'm so happy that I was a, you know, a recurring role on on Third Watch when it was on. Um, and now you're you know, on Gravesend now. Your recurring well, role, right? Yeah, Gravesend now. I'm uh, my third season, mm-hmm. which I just saw you the other yes. night on set. It was as, amazing. Uh, FBI agent Murano, and uh, it's a great role. And there's so many wise guy roles on the show. Yes, as you know, the show set uh, in the '80s is about the mob in the '80s. But William DeMeo, who I've worked with for such a long time you were in now. You the movie with him in Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn? You guys were in that well, movie Well, Once Upon a too? Time in Brooklyn, we wrote, William and I wrote together. Uh, I produced it with him and I directed it. So, but I also played a small role in it. Like when mm-hmm. I direct, I don't play big roles. It's got to be hard you know, to do that. Too much. To play too many yeah. hats to do that. You know, yeah. it, would, it has it's to take a much. very... Yeah. A disciplined person to do that, but it also, if you're, if somebody you're like me is a perfectionist, it's probably it's kind of hard for me to do all three things at one time. I'd have to do one thing to make sure it's it was impossible perfect. to be efficient at everything yeah. if you're doing everything. Like jack of all trades, yeah, master you, of none. But you, you can't. can't. You know, it's just I find even when I when I'm directing, if I'm playing a role, I know that there are certain things that are suffering even maybe in my own coverage of my own scenes because I'm not back there behind the monitors and watching and looking at all the little things that I look at. So, you know, in Hollywood it's different Mm -hmm. because in Hollywood, you know, there's so much preparation time. There's so much pre-production. There's so many, so, so many crew members and personnel. There's so many, there's rehearsals. So by the time they get on set, everyone knows what the director's vision is. Right. So if the director's the lead, Ryan Gosling is like, you know, starring and directing in it 
the director of photography. They know what the vision is. They have a shot list. They have storyboards. So you know they're 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 covered. Right. But independently, Depend- it's hard it's, because you don't have that kind of thing. budget. It's not. It just. It's just. Right. It's kind of you're doing it as you're going. I, mean, along. I give William a lot of credit. Yes. For trying to wear all these hats, but but I know that if he if he just let himself play the lead yes. and do everything else he did because he's a magician at at raising money. Yes. He he always, like we've done a number of movies together. We made a movie together called uh, Searching for Bobby D, mm-hmm. which is a comedy. Carmen Electra's in it, Sandra Bernhard, and uh, a lot of people. And Once Upon a Time in Brooklyn, which you mentioned, uh, which had Armand Asante and Kathy Moriarty yep. and Ice T. I love and Kathy. Ja she was on the show. She was oh, was she? Yep. She's wonderful. And, and then Catherine but, Narducci does a guest host with me too. So we had, oh, yeah. that's right, that's right. Yeah, and yeah. I've worked a lot, you know, with Catherine. She's the best. As a matter of fact, Narducci. last year we we honored her at uh, I I run an Italian feast uh, in Rockland County, and it's one of the biggest Italian feasts in the country. And we honor every year, like you know. Uh, I better be invited this year. I you come better, you better come this I'm year, of course. Her. September fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth in Tapan, New York, at the Masonic Park, and we honored Kathy Narducci last year as you know as an. I I think she, you know, she just mentioned that to me actually the other oh, okay. night. I was with her at dinner. She's like, I, she was like, love feast. She, she's like, every time I talk to you, I'm telling you, I'm going to another feast. When she came to this one, though, she, she was blown it. away. She was like, Paul, I never expected it to be like this. She said she loved that, and she told me she loved the feast in Boston. She says the Boston feast was. Amazing. Oh yeah, they do. They do a good feast in Boston because it's like old school Italian yeah. with everybody hanging out exactly. and everybody going to each other's houses, yeah. and they have the kids that are. Flying with uh, like with the with the angel wings like, across the buildings. I said, I can imagine letting your kid do that. I go in this day and age. I go I only only us will let that happen. But it's it, do you feel that as an Italian American, your pigeon hold to to the roles that you have to like? Do you feel like you have, you have to be a gangster, a cop, or no? Because you know, a, a plumber, or whatever they, they think we are. We're, we're, we're not getting enough of of the Italian American roles. I mean, there's a lot of actors that aren't Italian American or get and are getting the roles. That you would think an Italian American would play get. it better. You know, we have the charisma. But for uh, it. but you know, there's there's you know all this political correctness and all this diversity now in casting. Isn't so it it's tough. But I listen. We as actors, uh, you know, I don't know any actor that really could genuinely say, "Oh, I don't like being typecast. I, I don't like that I'm always playing." Listen, if you're working a lot, then shut up. I don't care if right. you get cast as a garbage man every time. You know, be thankful that, that you're you working. A, right. Because do agree. something different with that. Be a different kind right, of garbage man. Right, be a different man. kind of garbage man. Do you know? something else. Right, exactly. But, you know, I'm always happy. But, yes, I've mostly played, you know, uh, you know, hoods and wise guys and and cops and detectives. I've mostly done that. But I've also played, you know, Jewish. I, 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 I've played um, Middle East. I got my Screen Actors Guild card by playing a nondescript Middle Eastern with an accent. Wow. On, uh, uh, as the world turns on a soap opera, I played wow. a terrorist, and they did me up and all that, and I had the accent down, and I got cast in the role, and that earned me my Screen Actors Guild card. Right. At the time, they weren't merged unions. Right. So I feel like I've gotten a lot of opportunities. There's not enough out there. Right. It's even harder now with yeah. technology. Before, you'd go in... And, you know, uh, there'd be like a guest starring role, let's say, for uh, Law and & Order, and they'd pull in like their 12 favorite guys. Right. And out of those 12 guys, and they'd book a session of casting, and then out of those 12 guys, they'd bring three or four in for callback. Mm-hmm. Now it's all push button, self-tape, self-tape. Okay, well, let's have our assistant have this one come in, uh, send the tape, that one, this one, this one, push a button. Next thing you know, you're up against, you know, 200 people. actors from all over the country instead of, just Instead local the, New York right, actors. Local, right. So it's become so much more competitive. Do you find that there's more people who are wanting to act now? Do you think that social media had a lot to do with that? Maybe? That's with a good the- question. Nobody ever asked me that. And you're probably right because... The only thing is a lot of nonsense on social media. Like, I look at Facebook and I keep seeing these posts like, booked it, booked it, yeah, booked it, yes. booked it, booked it. Yes. I mean, you know, half of that is people that are doing extra work. Yes. On the set of such and such again for yes. another, you know, you know, with, and then, you know, and they're just, you know, not to not doing background work because I did it back in the day too. But, I mean, that's not that's really not playing acting. roles in right. movies. But um, It's not really an art. I, I, you, 
Even though it's important yeah. in in like in the setup of a movie, of course, like this, the extras are important. Not that they're not 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 to. to uh, uh, diminishing that role, but it's not really. You're not. You're not. You're not using an art. You're not acting. You're not showing your skill. Well, you know, a, a term that's used sometimes for, as opposed to a- extras or background, is uh, uh, background artists. <laughs> you know, so so like as if, and, and honestly, if you do it right, you you could make or break a scene. Yeah, because if course. everything blends properly. It's good, but it if you've got great. that one extra that's Swapped like on, looking that, at the camera, yeah. or is overdoing it, or waving their arms around, with, right. you know, in their back, you know, and everybody's staring at that little spot instead of which drives me crazy doing. sometimes when I'm directing and I'm like, "What are you doing?" You know, it's like just be there. So some people consider, you know, extras just as you know, well, they're props or they're warm bodies, but they it do play a significant role yeah. in the atmosphere in the atmosphere of the scene or, or you know or any scene when you when you do have them. Yeah. I, I, I did my first extra extra in the in the show the other night. It was pretty exciting. Oh, that was the other night when you were at the yes. bar. Yep. The sushi exciting. bar. We yep, the, the sushi bar. It was we exciting. the sushi bar in yeah. Brooklyn. I was like, I teased my yeah. hair back up because it's set in the AZ. I was like, and just like that, I'm back in 1988. Yeah, you look a lot <laughs> d- different uh, today. But what you were saying about, do I think more people are getting into it? Yes, what happened was there was a trend, and I think it's still happening, of, uh, and I don't know if it's with women. I think it's mostly with men. Where they're retiring at much more reasonable ages than years, you know, years ago people would work like forever. Yes. People now, if they can afford it, especially cops. Yes. You know, they're retiring with these great pensions and they're like, I, I think I want to be an, be an actor. actor. And they go out and get a headshot. They're not yeah. actors. Most of them don't study. But they start off maybe doing some extra work and they have the police uniform. So they're hired for those scenes yes. and they get paid extra for the police. And next thing you know, one thing leads to another, they might get a role, they might get an agent. So you do have a lot, a lot of that that I see. Cause I could just see it from what? Facebook and Instagram and the, you know, the posts that people make. I mean, I'm, I have a lot of people that are friends or followers on social media that I don't know. I've never met, but I just try to be a nice guy and, you know, accept the friendships and be friendly and reciprocate. But a lot of it, I know, and I, I get so many messages, I can't tell you. Can you recommend this? Can yeah. you help me get an agent? Uh, do you know of any care? How could, can you help me get on Gravesend? Can you do this? And I, I, I never don't answer. I always right. just try to be nice. But but it is hard because it's you, you're trying to find work for yourself. Self, for you to help somebody. Yeah, yeah. That you, it's still a hustle for yourself. Of course. I mean, listen, I think, uh, you know, you always want to help somebody else, but it's like some people are very intrusive. I get uh, DMs all the time from, I mean, just with my business, it's like, yeah. and they're texting me at, it's four o'clock in the morning. It's like, dude, like I'm sleeping. Yeah. They think I'm up all night. Do you know what I should do with Botox? Or, I'm like, uh, what do you think? I'm uh, up all night, like <laughs> with my with my needles in my hand. Like what goes on? And I find, that I think that social media has made things that you they could connect you so easily to other people now, and then they just people I think become more intrusive with it. I think, even yeah. though they don't mean to be, I think it's just people are just excited and they just think of something, and people are compulsive and they start. Let me write Paul Bukowski at four o'clock in the morning about a role. Well, they but, think that like if they do it on social media, that they're not disturbing you because you're you're not you right. Because I have my alert. I don't get alerted for anything other than text messages. And, and phone calls. I don't get email alerts. I don't mm. get, I don't want to be hearing my phone binging all no. day every time there's a Facebook thing or a, a Instagram thing. So they, people assume that, you know, well, if I send you a message in the middle of the night, you're not going to see it till tomorrow, which usually I, I won't unless I happen to be on social media very late at night, which I often am because we're all addicted we're to all addicted. scrolling. True. They say that, that average people scroll as far and as long as the Empire State Building in a day. Isn't that oh, crazy? God. Well, I, listen, I don't How even like to look. Isn't that crazy? I don't That's, even like to look at my screen time because I look at it. I'm like, seriously? Think about I that. Do? That's Isn't that crazy that an average person scrolls up that as tall as the Empire State Building in a day? Oh, is that what you meant by yeah. that? Isn't that crazy that you're scrolling up that much in a, in a 24-hour Oof. period? That, that Yeah. Isn't that nuts? Think about that. That's crazy. So as many times as you're scrolling up is as high as you're going up in the Empire State Building. I was when I saw that I'm like you know what, but it, 
I could see that, especially with the kids. They're on the phone all day long. They can't stop. They I'm like I tell my kids, look up. The world is three is is five inches up ahead of you, not down here. I but wish I could get credit for a step for every time I did a scroll, because <laughs> it's the days of it. Used to be the, the days used to be of like how many miles did I run today? Now right. it's like how many steps did I take today? Like you know, that's how things change miles, when you're getting older. Steps. So I was like, if I could get a step for every scroll, I, I would, I'd take that. I'd be in great be, shape. We'd be in good shape then. Yeah. I know I would be. I know I would be in great shape then. What do you feel like if you if you are going to if you are talking to somebody who is aspiring? What would your what would your best advice? Be. Do something else. <laughs> and I'm serious. People come to me all the time. Can you talk to my son? Can you talk to my nephew, my niece, my whatever? Uh, and I'm like, I, I'm, if you want, I'm going to be completely honest with them. And, and they go, well, what do you mean? I go, I'm going to tell them that if there's anything else they could do that would make them happy, do it. Because, you know, if you want to have a normal life and you want to have a, 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 a get married and have a family, have children, have security and have a regular paycheck and, you know, be able to have a you know a pension and all these things that come along with that that they that they give you do something else because <laughs> this is it's so it's unstable i mean i've been very very fortunate i feel very blessed that i've had a good career and then i've been able to make a living whether it's in front of the camera or behind the camera right but i'm sure if i had done almost anything else and put the same amount of time into it that i'd be so much wealthier because, you know, there's certain things that if you put the time in, right. you're going to get the results. Of course. It's not like that with acting because, right. you know, you, it's it's kind of like you have to be ready, but you have to be ready for when your number comes up. Right. But it's it's who it, the talent is important. So you it's it's so much of it is who you know. I mean, so much of the casting is already decided on. Right. I, mean, I mean, if you think about it, if there's a small role in a film, it's the clerk at a hotel. You know, wh why is the producer or the director going to give it to a stranger? Can you imagine how many people they know that they're, that they're of thinking course, of? course, they're going to give it to Let me give it to this one. Let me give right. it to that one. So a lot of the casting notices that come out and the breakdowns that our agents get, they're listing roles, but they're already, but they're already decided they're upon. Already decided. So they're spinning our wheels, you know, right. to send in self-tapes for these things when, you know, most of it's already cast. And, peop and, and, and casting is packaged. So if you go to an agent and you, and you have a... Um, you want a, like a certain lead, mm -hmm. you know, let's just say it's Cameron Diaz. Now that agent has so many other people they represent. So they're going to read the script and say, oh, you know, I have this other client. I know there's a two, three day role for this. You, you could consider this person. Right. Now, of course, if you have other people that are just as good if, or if not better, <clears throat> and you're going to say, well, you know what? Let me stay on their good side because I might at some point need to use the favor up and say, yeah. could you please have Cameron, right. Cameron do this? And so you're going to cast more of their people with right. the bigger agency because you're getting feathers in your cap by doing that. And I know that as a director because there's times we've cast people and they've pitched us people for the smaller roles and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Did you ever sure. cast somebody that you really did you really wanted somebody else for for that reason? Like did you well, have to the, the things that that uh things that have been pushed on me as a director mm -hmm. have been putting people in roles because of investors. Right. Whether it's an investor or an investor's daughter, or things like that. Like, oh, we got to put them in. Right. You know, you got to. We got to put them in. We got to. You know, I told them I was gonna. You know, you know. Uh, and I'm like, oh, oh, God, God, you know, it's like every little role is important. Every moment, every nuance. Well, of course, because it's a story, and you're and you have a vision of what when you're when you're when you're making a movie. There's, it, it's like it's a vision board, and you're looking, and and every piece has got to be has got to work, and it's got to it's got to fit in. And if it, there's a, one piece that doesn't fit, yeah. the whole thing falls apart, right? You have an unnatural moment, and it's like, why? You know, I always watch movies now and I or TV shows, and I'm like, okay, that was a favor role. <laughs> that was a favor role. Like I know, I could just can tell. tell now. Yeah, can I could just tell. I was like, why would they cast this person? Yeah. Like, what could have possibly possessed them? It's got to be there's. It's got to be somebody's cousin, son, yeah. daughter, brother-in-law, whoever it yeah. is, or uh, somebody who gave in a lot you of money. You see that a lot on like a, a Lifetime Network and Hallmark. Oh my God. I find that you know I see these people and I'm like, okay, that's somebody's, that's uh, somebody's brother, brother, that's somebody's right. uh, daughter. You know, it's my like, daughter wants to be an actor. Can you yeah. put her on, please? And like, it's like they couldn't, have, they can't act to save their life. I yeah. mean. Listen, I get that, and I get it in the as as a business person. Also, I get that in the business, and you need the money to make the to make the film and do it. However, 
if it's not going to work, it's not going to work. And then what's going to happen is you're going to have a product that's not going to sell. So what's the point of doing it? You're going to lose money if you don't do it right. So yeah. some you have to do it right. But I, I, I understand what sometimes you might have to compromise I, I, at some point. But yeah. hopefully you get people that can you can halfway work with and, and work with them. Did you ever feel like that? something you said to an actor like say that was on on the movie would help them be a better a, a do better in the scene like that you like made it click oh yeah them? well well a lot of people have told me and i'm flattered because i it. could see you being very patient and very good with with training like and 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 giving and giving like a young actor like okay do i think i am way. because i'm all about making the actor comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I think your best performance has come when somebody's comfortable, mm -hmm. not nervous, doesn't feel the pressure. So I've been told, and, and, and I'm flattered by it, by a lot of people that I'm a director's, uh, uh, an actor's director. Mm -hmm. So some directors are very technical. Yes. They're worried about the technical aspects and they're not really working with the actor to help mold the story. Well, they look at the actor more like a prop. work with their character. Right. Well, they're just not, well... They're just assuming that the actor prepared in such a way that's correct for the story. Right. It's also different when you write it and direct it. Because when you write it and direct it, you have a much stronger vision. Right. So when you're watching the actor, you're like, no, no, you know, it's it's more like this or it's more like that. But I've I've always been very patient with the I mean, I think I think I am very patient with the actors. And I, I, I give them, uh, you know, as many takes as I can. Uh, you know, every every now and then... I go bad on a set, but you have to go bad every now and then so people just know you have it in you. So they just don't think you're like Mr. Patience. Right. Or, you know, uh, especially when you got to move along the cat, the, the crew and, you know, you're losing time and you're falling behind and all that. But I love working with the actors. I mean, that's like really my, my favorite part of it. I, lo I love every department, and that's why I like at directing so much because, you know, you're involved in every aspect of this, you know, right. uh, of the production. Of the whole thing. You know, the, the whole, I'm looking at everything from, you know, the noticing that really cool color you have in your background right now, that like, right, to the, that, to the, that to purple. The set of glasses to, set on so the whether table. or not this is in the shot and shouldn't right. be. Or and if it's half empty or half full. Because that's when I yell, to too. And I'm like, <laughs> what is the bottle of Poland and the script doing in the shot? So I have to notice this? Can't right. someone else Nobody notice else this? Nobody else notice this? Right. Yeah. Uh, it, but it, it, it's a lot. It's a lot for being to be a director to notice all that because so many things. But you need people. You, you have right. to be able to delegate. But the current production that I I, I had mentioned to you, um, <clears throat> we just finished uh, shooting a pilot episode and it's going to be airing soon. Um, and I wanted to bring you uh, a bag of this beef jerky. Uh, because, oh, I was going to ask you yeah, about that. This is the jailhouse jerky. I had a lot of control on that in the way of uh, my cousin Tony Darrow, who mm -hmm. I'm sure you know. He's also on Gravesend. He's been yes. Goodfellas, Sopranos, Mickey Blue Eyes. He's your cousin? Tony's my cousin, yeah. I mean, his real name is Borgese also. Uh. But back in the day, he's quite a bit older than me. So back in the... Well, his father had him when he was in his 20s. My father didn't have me till he was like 46. So mm -hmm. that's why we have a big age difference. So he's more like an uncle to me. But... Uh, Tony uh, and I... Uh, uh, oh, back in the day when he was, you know, doing his comedian and singing work... Um, his agent said, Borgese, people are screwing it up. They're saying Borgese, Borgese. We're going to call you Tony Darrow. Okay. So Tony said, okay. So he changed his name as, as a stage name too. But we recently wrote and produced and I directed uh, uh, a TV podcast called The Jailhouse Jerky Crew. Okay. And what happened was we got involved in this company. Uh, we're, we're shareholders in a, in a beef jerky company. So it's called Jailhouse Beef Jerky. Tony's on the cover of, of the beef jerky. So... Instead of doing like commercials, we said, well, let's do a series and incorporate uh, the beef jerky as a product placement in the series That's a great to idea. promote it. So wow. it's really funny because, uh, and I was, you know, able to handpick the cast. Mm -hmm. You know, my cousin Tony Darrow's playing the lead. I played a role in it. I didn't want to, but they wanted me to. Louis Venari is in mm -hmm. it. Um uh, Chuck Tuxedo. Zito, Chuck Zito's in it. Is Sid in it too? Did Sid come in too? Uh, Sid Rosenberg, yeah. yeah, we put gave my, Sid a my, role. My best buddy. Yeah, William DeMeo, I, I put him in a, in a much, much different role than it's something that he's never played before. When you see it, you're going to crack up. Christian DeMeo, his son. So I handpicked the cast and wrote it knowing who was playing those roles. Okay. So that was, I didn't, I, I mean, I didn't have to force anybody in except for like, you know, like extras. Like, you know, when it became mm -hmm. this, the social club scenes, forget it. Everybody wants to be in the social club scene and be a wise guy. So it's like, you got to put this guy in, you got to put that guy. So yeah. I worked with that to try to make it look, not look too crowded. But it, it's really funny and it's, it's you know. Did you get some of the people who hang out on the grave sense? Grave sense oh yeah, there's, well, I mean, some of the names <laughs> I just mentioned. You oh yeah, yeah, we have some some of those guys. Peter Gaudio's also <laughs> in, uh, in the jailhouse jersey. 
Jerky Love Crew. Peter Gordio. He's my that guy. He's is a great guy, and he's best. he's very good, and he plays uh, PD Muscles, mm-hmm. and um, P- perfect for him because yeah. he's a trainer too, yeah. and he looks great for his age. My God. Oh yeah, yeah. He's he in some good. He's in great shape. He's in terrific shape. Wow, right? Louis Venaries right was really really funny in it. So it's a mob comedy, mm-hmm. and it doesn't take itself too seriously. And what's what's funny is what happens is these guys, the crew, they get out of jail, and then the boss Tony Darrow says, "All right, you guys are out. You did the right thing. You kept your mouth shut. You didn't rat. Now you got to start earning again. Come up with some ideas." So they're mm-hmm. coming up with ideas and. Stupid ideas, funny ideas. It's all very comical. And then Louis Venarius' character, who plays Loopy Louie, he says, I got an idea. He goes, there's a tractor trailer coming through with high-end electronics. He goes, how about we, we hijack that? And he goes, Christmas is coming. So it's a good idea. Do that. Next thing you know, he calls the boss and says, could you come down to the warehouse? I got good news and I got bad news. He goes down and says, well, what's the good news? He goes, well, instead of just one tractor trailer, there were two, so we hijacked two. He goes, oh, that's great. Well, what's the bad news? He says, well, they weren't filled with high-end, high-end electronics like we thought. They were filled with beef jerky. So the boss is like, beef jerky? What the F are we going to do with, 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 you know, when you unload these two tractor trailers, we're going to have a warehouse full of beef jerky. So they start trying to come up with ideas of like, get rid of it we can't sell it because it. it's got barcodes on it and labels. Right. So they repackage it and put the boss's picture on the cover. <laughs> and he's pissed at first, but then it, it, it starts becoming to like sell, successful. It becomes a thing. So now we're going to have, you know, so it's an ongoing a series now and it incorporates... You know, the, I was going to bring you a bag too, oh, so I could have bring me held it up right yes, now and promoted it, and I and I forgot. Bring it. I'll I'll I'll, yeah. I'll, sh- I'll shout it out for you. It's 100%. a very it's a very it's called Jailhouse Beef Jerky. It's actually on the shelves now. So when people see the show, where they're not going to. Where is it selling right now? Well, it's going to be in Shoprites and it's on Walmart dot com and Amazon dot com. What a great! Yeah. You, you're going to start sales sales pitching for people. We're going to do instead of having commercials <laughs> doing that. That's yeah, a great a, idea. Yeah. Well, people see the show, they would never think. There's a real There's product. They just think it's part of the storyline. When they That's find amazing. out, wait a minute, I could buy that on the shelves. They're going to want to buy it. And then when you walk down the supermarket aisles and you see, like, you know, a big display unit with all the beef jerky and advertising the show, you're going to say, oh, it's, I got to watch the show. I'm going to pick up a bag and watch a great, the show. But that's a great idea. Do you know who else did something similar to that? Do you know, um, you know of course, um, uh, the Daily Wire? Do you know the... the, the yes. He is, the president of the company did the whole thing about the raises, the man raises. Did you ever see that? And it went viral. So he, it, he, it, the, Gillette, I think they, they uh, banned them because they were a Republican station. And so he made oh. his own raises, but he made it like a, a like a movie about, and it's a commercial. And it got like 20 million views. Oh, you got to watch it. I saw that. I have to see it's, it. Yeah. I'll send it to you. It's great. But it, it sounds something like that. But what a great way to have, make a product and, and then, and then like, yeah. you know, um, commercialize it, and then I mean, he sold a lot of raises, and it's like, it got like twenty million. Maybe that's going to happen. Is that that company that uh, has the razors? It's called the his Man name. Razors. It's his like, name is it the Man or yeah, is it his name? It's not his name. It's called. Um, oh, okay. I can't think of it right now because I know I started getting those razors that are like. Je- yeah, Jerry's razors. I can't Jer- remember. Jeremy's razors. I know, Jeremy's. but I get it. Yes, it's Jeremy's razors. That's that's his that his it? name. Yes, he's the owner of the one. Daily Wire. Yep, and he you're did. very good at this, by the way. Oh, thank you. She's, a, she's a good host. Oh, thank you. You're thank very you. good. I'm, I'm a natural, right? You are a natural. You thank, really are good. Look at this, and it's coming from Miss, uh, from my my a great actor right here telling me this. And, and, and you look beautiful. Actor? You really do. Oh, and I love that color. That really you. is a nice. We match. We look like we're going on a on a honeymoon together. On a honeymoon. Where are we May, going? I don't know. Wherever you want to go. Well, you you tell me. Let's go to Sicily. I love to go to Sicily. We'll go to Sicily. I will you go look there. like you fit in in Sicily. I totally fit in in Sicily. I'm Sicilian. <laughs> I'm from where? I'm from Casa Fratrano. You see? Say Palermo. Do you speak Italian? I wish I did. Yeah. I was and I was the president of the Guild of Italian American Actors for four years. I I love that. Back in when it was, you know, more of a an entity. Uh, you but yeah. you weren't at Paisanicon though. To, <laughs> don't let me start. <laughs> Paisano Con, what was it? Paisano Con. Listen, it was there was fun. Sopranos Con, there was Mob Movie Con, which I was booked and paid for to be there and sign autographs and do all that. But when I heard Pi- Paisano Con, but a lot of people uh, were there. The whole, I was Lorraine Bracco, Bracco was there. I couldn't believe it. She was there. Yeah, but she was there. 
Kathy was there. That's what gets him there. Al was there. I met, I met the whole there. cast. Kathy was laughing at me. She's like, I'm not going to knock anything because, you know, there's people that worked hard on putting that together and there's people I know that were there. But I, just Paisan Khan, I, I don't think it was all about Italian American culture and everything Italian. Right. I think it was a little, it was kind of a. Do you think it was more like. Do you a, think it was I more think it was like more of a um, Goomba event. Yeah. People. Thought of it as that. You so. thought it was more car- the caricature of what you wanted yes. to be. I, I see. Yeah. You're, you're like that. You sound. I don't want it to say that you're like as old as my grandmother, but you sound like my grandmother because she thinks that like Italians should be known for the not not the gumba version of being Italian, but you know for art and for food and yeah. you know for for culture like our culture because we're not just all. She's gangsters right. and but she's you know, right and it's not just her generation that thinks that i mean there's uh, my gender i feel yeah. the same way i i don't think that we should and i don't i don't want to be equated to everything about the sopranos that should be like not yeah. that i don't love the sopranos i'm not saying that but that's not what only italians are about yeah but you just to, just to people i mean i think everyone knows that italian americans have contributed so much to this country we built this country we built after this world country, war ii but at the same time they just embrace the mafia genre. Yes. You know, they, they, it, it's romanced in movies and TV shows. Of and course. it's not like it's inaccurate. I mean, it's part of history. Yes. But we can't deny... No, we're not going to deny it, it, but that's not know? only what we're about. It's not, but it's always going to be there. And But but we're okay with it as Italians because... Like, we can laugh at it, but you yeah. know what? If there was another culture, they would be offended over it. You, well, right? well, that's the difference. I mean, you know, you you can't say this about about this culture or that nationality or this religion, but you know, whatever. The Catholics take take all the crap they do. The Italians just roll with the punches. But you see, that a lot of these other people, and I don't want to start getting political because I never, I really don't talk politics. But you have certain groups that are looking for retributions and right. things like this and handouts us? and all that. You know, Italians were very, very discriminated oh, against. Oh, so bad. And it, when they first came here, there were ads that said, no Italians apply. Well, you know where WAP, WAP you know, came from? Without papers. Without papers. Yeah. That's what we called. My father came here from, from it was he, he came here from Sicily. Nothing. They had nothing. They lived in tenements. In the Lower East Side, no running water. That they lived in poverty. This is poverty. Yeah. That is, po- and they were thankful that they were here. Well, that's the difference. Italians, they they came they here came to be American. Yes, they nobody were proud nobody else comes here to be no. an American. You know, they wanted to learn the American ways. They were teaching their children. No, no, you know, you know the language, but speak Ameri- English. Right. We they would to, they were telling their speak kids English. to speak the, speak English. And and we didn't. Instead of us complaining and looking for retribution, Never. and it, we, Never. all we did was make our own way as Italian right. Americans and become successful. You know, as a culture, and moved on, and sh- and we show the America dream really exists because in a generation, w- my father went from having nothing to his children being successful, and yeah. having businesses and homes and all going to college and everything. I, so it's like, how do you say that? I was reading something about Ron, a speech Ronald Reagan gave, and it was such a beautiful speech. I'll just give you a quick part of it. It said, "You go to any country. You could go to Germany. You're never going to be a German. You're going to go to France. You'll never be a French. But when you come to America, you're an American, and it's sure. so true. And that and that's such a beautiful thing to think about. When you come here, you become an American, and that's and that you can't you." It's such a beautiful thing, and and we, I think, as Italian Americans, embrace that, and we're proud to be an American. My father fought in the war, like, and 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 he didn't complain. He didn't say, "My God, I I came here, I had nothing, I lived in poverty." No, he got up and went to work and built his business and did what he had to do every day. But we want they wanted to be Americans. Not they every did. Uh, very few to come here now. Come here wanting to be Americans or even agree with our ways. No. You they don't know, even agree with our way of life. They're coming here just to get what we have to offer, and that's it. You know, it's true. I yeah. think that it. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you know things are shifting. I hope. I'm. I'm I think, but I think that this this world they need a, especially the kids need a big wake up call. Yeah. They need a well, I think call. after that debate, I mean, Biden really proved that he's really going to really rebuild this country and make it such a great country again. <laughs> I just have to say that. <laughs> he answered all the questions, though. He answered, he answered all, all the, the questions. questions. And he knew all the facts. He d- that was wow. her second line. D- it was, it, you, it was, it Joe, was, you answered Joe, all the questions. Joe, you answered all the questions. It was crazy. And it you was, knew all the facts, oh. which he didn't. 
He didn't. But let's not. Well, let's, let's not talk about that. It's okay. Not, it's okay. Yeah. Everybody knows it now. There's, there's, they, there's, yeah. You can't even hide it anymore. It I'm is voting for Miley Cyrus anyway, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm voting for myself. I think I'm going to run. I'm gonna Miley, run if you're out there and you're watching this, you have our vote. Please call me. You, ha- you have our vote. I used to not even vote. like you. Now I'm obsessed with Miley Cyrus. <laughs> I don't know why. You, you listen to her music? Her music. I just think she's... You love yeah, her? Yeah, I love her. All right, Miley, if you're out there, you have and a... And she's so sexy. A, I have to say it. She's so sexy. You have a date with, with Mr. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, she's yeah. going to come running to go out with me. I Why know. not? You're a handsome dude. Okay, you're well, well to do. Well, call cool. her. Listen, tell Italians, you know, we're, we got the charisma. They're totally. You're better than any any country singer, Paul. Don't worry. You country got singer. <laughs> <laughs> I, singing, I can't do. That, I bet I, you you can. No, if no. If you try. No. Well, you could do everything else, though. No, I be, can't do everything else. I have a feeling you could do it. Well, you could cook, right? Because you had a I'm, restaurant. I, yeah, but I wasn't the chef. But I still My bet you could make were. a mean sauce, though. I was the front man. Uh, uh, that I could believe. <laughs> that I'm sure. That I was the one who went over to the tables to talk to everybody and make everybody feel, you know, That's total. That would be totally your role. If I owned a restaurant, that would be totally my role. And I role. love that. Yeah. No, it's of course, because you're talking to the people, you're with the people. That's all. That's what it's all about. Do you miss that ever? Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, uh, and I was in business twice. The second time, I also had a restaurant in Piermont, New York, which was originally called the Riverside Cafe. Now it's called the Sidewalk Bistro. So I was there for uh, over five years. But doing, you know, my career as well, I was like a you know part owner there. Yeah, no, I loved it, but it's a very tough business to it's restaurant hard business. business. Too many too. hours. Um, it, it's it's a tough tough business. You have to have a love for it, or be born into it, or yeah, be addicted hard. to it. It's very it's a lot you know, of it's a lot of work. I don't know it's how like, chefs do it. I just uh, it's a, it's a lot of work. My my brother in law, really my is. sister was in, is in the business. It's a lot. I I don't I don't know if I could do. It. I mean, even though my business is hard, but it's rough. Do you, do you ever? The one last question: Do you ever regret that you didn't do something else that could have made you more money than being an actor? Do you ever regret mm. that you didn't go down a different avenue? Because you said before that you, you could have went down a different no. avenue and made maybe, you know. No, I can't say that because it's not just about that. You know, I mean, everything I've done will be around forever. So every time I, I play an acting role, every time I direct something, every time I produce something, every time I write something that's published or produced, it's going to be around forever, especially sure. now with streaming. I've yep. done things many years ago that I thought were, you know, dead and buried and they came up and and now they're the resurfacing backup. resurfacing resurfacing so uh i don't have children but you know um i have nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews and, and yeah you're leaving a little bit of a legacy that's like you know my uncle or my brother or my whatever my friend was did this that so you 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 have this trail of accomplishments that are always going to be there even when you go you know if i was uh if i was selling microphones mm-hmm. I, maybe that you maybe I that. discovered the best microphone ever, and I'm a billionaire, right? But who's gonna know? That's you? all. Maybe, maybe remember that I discovered the, the. You know what? I think I would rather discover a microphone or become a billionaire than have been an actor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, well, but I'm happy. I'm I'm happy. I feel blessed uh, with my career that I've had. That's still going on. And uh, listen, as long as the work keeps coming, I'll I'll, I'll keep taking it, and doing it. Work. Well, I'm so glad you came on my show today. I'm so I, glad I, you had I'm me so on. Glad. I love him. He's the best. When are we going on our honeymoon? I, I, I'm ready to go tonight. I hope you got the tonight. tickets. Tonight? Yeah, I got my bags okay, packed. I'll, I'm ready to go. I'll call cool. and see if we can get on a flight. See if we can get on. You we better stay dressed like this. We could just go. We look, we look like we're ready to go. We away. don't have There's to pack. We'll just buy everything when we get there. I love that. I love your type of... That's my type of guy. You're my type of guy. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on my show today. And please tell everybody what is where where we can find you, your social media, um, and okay. what the next thing that you're going to be on that you are going to have out. Besides, I, I know the Jailhouse Jerky Crew and Gravesend, yeah. but is there anything else that is going to be coming down the... Well, my social media is basically my name across the board. I mean, my website is paulbergazi.com. It's very outdated, but there's a lot on there. Um <laughs> You know, I'm on Facebook as Paul Bergazi. I'm on Instagram as Paul Bergazi. I don't have to do the real or the official or all that. Um, <laughs> uh, I have a YouTube channel, Paulie B YouTube, but there's not that much on it. Um, as far as what's coming up, um, we're, you know, we're moving forward with the Jailhouse Jerky Crew, so that's going to be a series. So I have to, with my cousin Tony Darrow, we have to, we have to keep writing and, and now start producing um you know more episodes of course we go back in on gravesend in uh august. probably august 
and uh, uh, I have like a few things brewing that I really don't want to say anything about to jinx them because you know there's so much is like speculative and developmental. So we'll see. But there's some really good things uh, I think coming up, and it's gonna it's gonna be a good rest of the year. But my Italian feast, I really want people to come. You I'm have coming. to come. Okay. And I will tell them about the where it's it in, is. You'll just follow my social media. It's in Tapan, New York. It's September fifth, sixth. 7th and 8th, and I have everybody perform that you know. I mean, Louis Venere, Louis Venere performs with his band, Al Sapienza, um, uh, Stephen Maglio, does Sinatra, uh, Deborah Renard, uh, Dominic Keen AC performs. He we sings have, beautifully. We have all these, you know, a lot of the actors that are performers, you know. Uh, I, I can't say yet who we're honoring this year, but it's I, I know who I want to, but I, I haven't called them to spoke, speak to them about it. Um, I'll but be it's exciting. I better, I better be invited. Yeah. I'm coming. You're I'm invited. Coming. So everybody, Mr. Paul, and everybody, please follow him on his social media and check out the the uh, dates for the feast. And thank you for tuning in. And please check us out on Apple, on Spotify, and on YouTube. Everyone have a great day. This is Cats and Pudding. Bye.